Welcome back to July 2024 production update. We have a lot of news to share this month. Up first is we started shipping the alt mills. We ran into a couple things as we talked about in the last update, waiting on the wiring. Uh, we were also delayed on getting the plates coated. Um, because there were some scheduling issues at the coating plant. We also need to wire some of the spindles manually because they weren't done properly, but we got that ironed out. So we started shipping the alt mills out and we're hoping to get through that 50 before the end of the month, or at least in the next couple of weeks and get lots of good feedback uh, for the alt mill. We also have the resources available so that everyone getting the alt mill will be able to check that out and get their machine set up. And then once we iron all the nitty gritty details of the resources, maybe working on the video for that as well. On top of that, obviously the alt mill requires a lot of assembly and QA checking in our little production space as well. So we've brought on a bunch of new cheap people to help with the production management, with the packaging, QA process as well. Right now, I think we'll be able to ship 10 to 20 per week. The goal is to be able to ship over 100 per month by the time we kind of scale up production, maybe by the end of the year. Also, if you guys saw, we now have the alt mill spindle kit available for sale to the public. This means that anyone who has an alt mill who wants to buy the spindle kit, they can buy it separately. Or if you're somebody who has a long mill or another CNC machine that wants to get the, spin the same spindle kit, you're going to be able to do that through our store. Right now, we don't have all the resources available and the testing done for the spindle kit or long mills yet, but it is something that we're working on. You're welcome to order the uh, spindle kits now and they'll st start shipping in August, or you can wait till they're available. We just ordered another batch of 200 spindle kits. We ordered 200 for the current batch of alt mills and another 200 for partially for the next batch and also for people to buy on top of the, like, the non-alt mill customers. We expect to have the documentation for the long mill done in the next couple of weeks. So we'll put out an announcement once that's, that's ready. I think I can go through a couple of things that are kind of key things with the long mill and SLB compatibility. And also like some of the reasons why we are moving towards official support for the spindle. So if you guys read the article from probably more than a year ago at this point, we talked about some of the downsides and the integration of the spindles. So at that point, we had done testing for the spindles, but we weren't ready to provide a off-the-shelf version for customers. One of the reasons was because we didn't have enough incentive to source the spindles in the first place. So as a business, we need to order a pretty large quantity for us to make it a viable business option. And at that point, we weren't really sure if it was a good option for the majority of customers. And we didn't want to imply that people needed to get a spindle for their machine to get everything they needed out of the machine. And I still think that the Makita router for the majority of long mill users is perfectly good for that application. However, obviously over the past year or two, we've seen a lot more people integrate the spindle with their long mill. If we can offer a spindle option at this stage, we can. So we might as well have that option available. And because the alt mill and the long mill, at least the 1.5 kilowatt option is the same, we can do supply chain for both and the integration and testing for both pretty easily. So that's where we are with that. The second is the release of the SLB makes a big, big difference too. One of the main things that I learned by doing a survey for long mill users is that the majority of spindle users don't actually use the feature of uh, being able to communicate with the VFD to control the speed using G-code. People will still manually turn them on and off and also use the dial to uh, set the speed rather than using the computer to do it. Obviously, there's a couple advantages using the computer to set the speed and turn the spindle on and off. One is can set uh, like the exact speed you want to be cutting at, which can optimize ship load. And also it's a bit safer because so, you don't have to meddle with the turning it on and off. It'll do it automatically. And also G-Sender has features where you can add the G-code specifically to turn on and on the spindle and get it up to speed as well. The SLB has RS-485 communication, which allows for features like waiting for the spindle to speed up at speed up to the speed that you set it to. And also you can turn on and off if there's an emergency. 
which makes it safer and easier to use. Also, because there's just one cable going between the controller and the, the VFD, it also makes the setup a lot easier. Because the original longboard only has a PWM 5 volt output, some VFDs aren't compatible with that communication protocol. So you have to get an adaption board that turns the PWM 5 volts to a 10, 0 to 10 volt analog signal. And if you see a lot of people on the forum kind of confused on why their spindles aren't getting up to the right speed, it's because there's, it's not compatible with the communication protocol. With the RS45, because it's a digital communication, you always get the right speed regardless of the voltage. That's an important part. And because the SLB has stepper holding functions that reduces the current, when the machine is stationary, it means that it can handle the weight of the spindle better when the machine isn't moving. Also, some people report that their spindle will start to move down or droop because of the weight of the spindle. You can use dollar sign one equals two five five on the original longboard. However, because the current holding is for all the axes and is also 100% current, that can cause these steppers and the drivers to get hot, which isn't super ideal. Uh, Johan's been working on the integration part for the last little bit. If you can get the SLB with the spindle, the integration is much better, it's much easier, and has a lot more features that we think that people are gonna get value out of. So where we are with that. So there's a couple other things kind of on the plate for the spindle kit. From what I can see on the market right now, most of the spindle kits that are offered in North America are really, really expensive. I think rough, almost double the par price of the alt mill spindle kit, even though it's like the same hardware. You have a machine that you want to see this, this spindle kit be able to be integrated for, let us know, it might be another business option for us to explore if we want to support other machines as well. The other thing is that the spindle kit right now, we use an 80 millimeter dust shoe, so it fits around 80 millimeter spindles, but the uh, hose connection is a four inch hose connector. Because this was designed for the alt mill, which throws up a lot of chips, if you have a smaller machine like the long mill, uh, you might, you'll probably be able to get away with the 2.5 inch. So we will have probably 2.5 inch version of the shoe at some point as well. Long mill Mark 2.5, we just got in the SLBs for the second batch of production, which has been the part that we've been waiting on to be able to ship more long mills. Long mills are shipping now and we're working to get the shipping time down. Right now, we're probably looking at about three to four weeks. We're aiming for two weeks or less in the next month or so. You can check out the order page for the latest details. We are getting parts in for long mill, so shouldn't expect any surprises for long mill production as we move forward. Vortex orders continue to ship out as usual. We are also working on the official support for the fourth axis, independent fourth axis support for the SLB. What that means is that right now with the original longboard, to have the rotary axis move, you have to turn off the Y-axis motors and divert the power to the rotary axis motor. Basically, you, turn, you move the machine to its position, turn off the Y-axis, you divert the power, and then the rotary axis can turn with the switch. However, with the SLB, because we can control all four axes independently, if you we can connect a separate motor for the fourth axis. So the Y axis, the X axis, the Z axis can all move the same as it usually does, but there's also the rotary axis that can move as well. For that to be the case, we need to add another external driver to power the motor. We do have instructions on the resources for the SLB on how to do that. One of the closed loop stepper motors that we are using for the uh, alt mill project, basically have the driver and the, and the motor integrated. Although this might mean that people will have to remove their current motor. If they want to upgrade to have for full fourth axis motion, they'll have to remove the original motor and put in the closed loop stepper motor. In the long run, we think this will save a lot of the complexity because the driver and the motors are integrated together. And uh, because there's an encoder involved, it can also know its position uh, relative to where it moves. So we feel like it's the most streamlined version in the long run. That I think we are starting to do t more testing starting next week and we'll, we'll likely have a kit available in the next coming months. SLB news, we had another batch of SLBs arrive and the queue for any remaining orders for SLBs should be cleared by now, or at least by the time this video goes out. There hasn't been any major changes to SLB design except that we've made some tweaks to the SLB e-stop. If you guys don't know the original e-stop, it has the button and the three macro buttons and 
on there on the the button itself there's a light to show uh, the status we've moved the light to two leds on the board rather than on the button because it saves costs and the complexity and it makes it easier for us to replace the buttons if they get damaged although there's no functional changes and they're cross compatible between um, any version of the slb we have a batch of 500 in production now for the original button and then we'll have another thousand in production going on forward and i don't expect there to be any like notice on there to be the change because they are they all basically identical just on the placement of the lights themselves for the sprouter project we've made some interesting developments on that we've gotten another prototype motor that Johan has been testing. The results have been promising. Oh, and I should mention, if you guys wanna see the pictures, the graphs, the videos, and all that other content, make sure to check out the blog post because I put much more detailed information on there. Johan has tested the spindle that's going on the alt mill, the Makita router that most long mills have, as well as um, several iterations of the Sprouter Project's motor based on different tuning and power input. Here's kind of the breakdown of the results. The lowest speeds, the Makita has the highest amount of torque and then it drops proportionally to its speed. The spindle has a fairly flat torque curve. It has a lower torque curve at the, at the, the lower RPMs. However, by the time it gets to 20,000 RPM, um, its power output starts to overtake. The spindle power output becomes more advantageous the faster it's turned compared to the Makita router. The BLDC or the Sprouter tested in multiple configurations. We've seen kind of a large difference based on the tunings, but at its most optimal, although its torque starts off a little bit lower than the Makita, it's pretty high and, the, and second highest of all the tested motors, but it keeps a curve sh shallow, shallow enough that by the time it hits about 10,000 RPM, it's still outputting more power than all the other options that we have. What makes us feel about that result is that there is a chance for the BLDC Sprouter motor, even with a 1000 watt output, uh, sorry, input, can be as powerful, if not more powerful than the 1.5 kilowatt spindle option. It's potentially possible that that will be a lighter and more powerful option that can be used on the long mill and potentially the alt mill. We still have a lot of work that needs to be done for us to confirm this is the case. One of them is that this motor was tuned for 220 volts and because of the winding design, we are waiting on the 110 version to be made and finished and tuned. And we'll have to test that to see if we can get the same amount of uh, power out of the motor. The reason we're testing the, uh, we started testing at 220 is because the motor was designed for 160 volt input. And that was basically in between 110 and 220 so that we can pretty much use it at dual voltage. However, we found that the motor would, is better to be tuned one voltage or the other to make sure it's the most optimal and most efficient. That'll be our next sample project or sample motor to be coming in. Besides that, uh, now that we continue to do the testing, it also brings up some of the questions of how we're gonna approach this on a business level. Because of the motors and the cost development and all the hardware that goes into it, at the small volumes, I'm expecting that the cost for the spindle and the cost for the sprouter will be pretty much the same. Just a hardware cost because we might end up producing them at fairly low volumes, maybe like a thousand to three thousand units yeah. per year. The potential for this technology to be used for pretty much any hobby CNC machine is pretty good. I see a lot of uh, users move on to spindles and those spindles become more ubiquitous. And obviously, the hardware for CNC machines in general continues to improve. The potential is where if we can produce a lot of the sprouter and produce a lot of those motor components, then we can bring the cost down significantly. But that kind of brings us to a new uncharted territory of how do we support this product to be used in other machines, not just ours, because we don't have enough volume of customers to support this type of product to be made at the cost that we feel like is most optimal and most beneficial to the majority of users. The next thing is that uh, with this project, we're also looking at the lowest cost option, which is the Makita clones. Johan's been going back and forth with manufacturers in China. We got one of the samples back, but the speed control was really poor. We're back in the back and forth to try to get that improved as well. And also integrate the five volt control system so that it can be connected to the original longboard, the SLB and other controllers that use Gerbil to be able to control the speed yet. 
uh, the, the speed, but we don't have the electronics for that yet. This is sort of like a project that we're kind of passing into the, for the manufacturers rather than us doing this in-house at this point. So we'll kind of like communicate and wait on the samples to come in so that get something that works. And the goal is for this option to be sort of on the low end option, maybe like $150 around the same, basically the same price as the Makita, just with a couple extra features and the same form factor and the use case uh, of it. As you guys might have seen from the other update, we've been working on the panel computer project as well. We just got in the new panel computers, which are the ones without the fan. So I actually got one here. So rather than having a hole with the fan and the heat sink and everything, basically the back of this whole computer is the heat sink. What we found was probably the biggest reason these computers fail is because dust gets in components overheat and, and they break over time. Panel computers that are closed completely, we won't have that pro problem and they should be more reliable in the long run. They are a little bit more expensive, but maybe like 15 to $20 more expensive. So I feel that most people are willing to make, pay a little bit extra for that, the extra reliability. There are a couple things that we're trying to work out. One, and probably the biggest one right now is which operating system we want to use. The two main contenders are Windows 11 and Linux. And here are some of the breakdowns of the pros and cons of each option. So Linux is free. We can get any type of distribution for free. We don't need to go through licensing and things like that. However, Windows, we need to pay for. We might be looking anywhere from $10 to $65 from secondary sources or if we buy from Microsoft directly as a retail customer, that's all the way up to about $140 US, which ends up being a pretty significant cost increase for the computers themselves. We're looking at different ways to uh, get the license legally and legitimately, but it's been kind of difficult to find a good source for that. The other consideration is Linux, based on the surveys that we have, is not very popular. Uh, amongst the users. The majority of people have used uh, Windows at some point, which means that the learning curve to use Windows and the compatibility of Windows is greater. Ideally, if there wasn't a cost issue, we would probably go with the Windows option. The other thing is that with our initial testing, we found that the performance of G-Sender, it's better optimized on Windows than it is on Linux. We think that there's work that we can do to improve the speed of the operation on Linux with Gsender. However, it's something that we haven't done too much of yet, and we're not quite sure how much work it's gonna take. So that's something that we're weighing as well. Based on my current conclusions, if we can get the Windows licenses for a reasonable cost, they'll probably be a better option and people are gonna be more happy using it. However, if it's just something that we can't accomplish, then Linux may be the option. The other option is that we create images for Windows and Linux. We let the user decide if they want to purchase a uh, window separately or if they want to stick with Linux. Because basically we can make uh, images of the operating systems with all the integrations for G-Sender and all the other things that we want to put with the panel computers as file images on our, on our website. And people can download it and put it on either their own panel computer or on their own computer. So that will kind of like open up a lot of different options for people. So. Those are kind of where I am standing now. If you do want to provide some feedback um, and thoughts on the panel computer project, and if you want to share anything that you want to see that comes with it, we do have a survey on our uh, blog post for this month. So you can go check it out and provide feedback. It'll be busy as we continue to scale up Altmill production. And we're excited to see what people are going to start making with them. Thanks for stopping by and I'll catch you in the next production update. And don't forget to check out the blog if you want to learn more about all the stuff we're working on. All right, ciao.